and and and, and see the self, as I say, as you know, and you know that I take this term seriously. It's symbol that is, you know, deeply functional, indispensable to use my language, allow me uh, to, um, you know, relevance, realization, and establishing religio, but that it can be exapted, that it can be exapted, right? And this is sort of the ultimate Platonic idea, right? And you even get, I mean, you go back to Jung and he gets some of his ideas from, obviously, from Vedanta. The point of realizing Atman is ultimately to take you into the depths of Brahman, right? It's not, it's not to sort of stay. Uh, Atman. And th that's, again, part of my criticism of Jung, because Jung, although Anderson challenges me that this one is not true towards the end, but it's certainly true of the popular understanding of Jung. Jung's, Jung psychologizes everything. All of this is completely internal to uh, the psyche. Uh, I get what you said. You're sort of rejecting it, but um, there, there's, there's ultimately, it's, I think of it as a deep kind of training or a way of seeing that allows me to realize something about the depths of reality as opposed to just the depths of my psyche. That's how it, I find it functioning in a way that I think answers or at least addresses your question. Did that make any sense? Yeah, I, I agree, definitely. Um, yeah, there's also another, uh, quite a poetic explanation or description uh, Christopher had is, uh, on the description of the self in his talk with uh, Paul Vanderclay that I like that kind of reminded me of what you said there. Um, so for, for me, yeah. God, and I don't use this word very often, uh, but God at least is, is, is transjective. When I find the reciprocal opening between the archetypal self and sort of the ground of being, that's that's what I'm right. That that's what uh, brings me the the sense of fulfillment, um, rather than right. The problem with you know the, the, the your previous orientation, as you said, it's it's very introverted, um, and uh, and then you of course uh, you're vulnerable and you experienced it to the fact that you know that all that has to come along is a good Buddhist and say, but wait, on Atman, and then that whole thing is right. Uh, Right, but if you if you shift to a transjective reciprocal opening, on Atman goes from being a negative thing to an affording thing. It's like, of course, on Atman, that's how things. That is how and why things will reciprocally open, right? The inexhaustible, that sort of thing. So that, that's what yeah. worked for me. Maybe that I hope that lands for you, but that's what's worked for me. Yeah, uh, propositionally, that's that's absolutely the same conclusion I've I've come to, especially after like Nishitani, where uh, like the the absolute um, nihility, I think he calls it, versus the relative should be viewed as an affordance rather yeah. than, uh, yeah. you know, a privation. Yeah, it's had a profound impact on me, profound impact on me. Yeah, I uh, keep terms, coming back to the, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, 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 I keep coming back to him. Yeah, he, I've read him twice. I'm going to read it, reread the Religion and Nothingness again uh, while I'm now on this enforced break. Um, <laughs> um, but... Uh, oh. I, I, guess, I guess the issue then that, that I'm not addressing for you uh, is uh, how how to translate from that from something propositional into something more procedural or perspectival and participatory. Is that is that the issue that? Uh, that... And then I mean that's just something I have to do because I know you've recommended a lot of practices and uh, like meditation. Like I said, I've been trying for three years uh, somewhat autodidactically as well. And then recently I started trying like at the end of a session doing like active imagination when my mind is more empty. And that actually led to some interesting stuff, uh, yep. you know, like basically similar to what I would imagine, a, a, not exactly a lucid dream because I didn't feel like I had complete control, but a very vivid dream that might have had some insights that I wrote down afterward. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's good. I think you should... I mean, make sure that I think you said you have uh, like to integrate a, a, a an inward looking meditative practice with an outward looking contemplative yes. practice. But, OK, good. You're doing that. I, I think uh, given you see some of the recent work I've been doing, I think you also want to consider. I know it's very difficult right now for practical reasons, but I mean, we do have the virtual world. If you can take up a dialogical practice of some kind uh, mm -hmm. where you're trying to, you know, do, do the stuff that Chris and I are trying that we're trying to work out and the stuff I'm doing with God, like you know, circling, uh, authentic relating, and also bring, you know, uh, a dialogic element into it, uh, because that also tends to 
put into deep practice, you know, like you're enacting and realizing in both senses of the word, the transjective. It tends to foreground the transjective really, really powerfully. What, we, what Chris and I call the third factor. Um, that comes out much more powerfully uh, when you're in these kinds of mutual flow states. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm really curious to, to get into that as well. Um, so I did have a few ideas and, and connections that I'd be curious to share and, and other less uh, big questions. Um, so recently uh, I realized um, that like the way uh, we speak of potential in English as something we uh, have or someone has, maybe that could be related to a kind of modal confusion about yeah. potential in the West. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's, she it's, has potential for musical genius versus yeah. she is potential or something. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's right. Uh, I think that's deeply right. Um, I think the language, the, the English language, and I think part of the, the prejudice in favor of actuality is precisely because it's verbal, whereas potentiality is just a noun. Um, and so what you get is it gets reified and then simultaneously denied because it's not an object, which is, which is unfair. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you know, we talk about it as if it's an object, so it's not an object, so therefore it's ultimately some kind of illusion. But that's just that's a little circle that has to be broken out of, right? Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah very much. That's a really good point about how we make it an object and then deny its existence, but because that's the only way we talk about it, we think it's just unreal completely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then that might also relate to the difficulty in uh, well in English, I. I'm not sure what other languages treat it this way of making Corbin's divine double a viable option for us, given that it's, you know, the psychopomp to transformation and transcendence that you have to be rather than have, which yeah, yeah, relates yeah. to what we said. That's why I've been doing um, so much on aspirational rationality as a way of trying to re-understand uh, Corbin. I, I, of course, I'm deeply appreciative of the work that Sheetham has done. But the, the problem with that language is I think it needs to be integrated with Agnes Callard's stuff about aspiration. And, 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 and we need to reformulate the notion of prolep, like we need to incorporate proleptic rationality into our notion of rationality. Um, I, I, think, I think I brought this up with Thomas. I don't know if I did or not, but I, it's like one of my concerns is like, like when, when you're doing this stuff, the divine double, the sacred second self, Right there is like there, there's a kind like, reciprocal opening when you get the anagogia that's when it's working but of course there's terrific mm -hmm. dangers of reciprocal narrowing that people need to be made aware of and reflect on and be on guard against and be vigilant for because this it can fall into right you know because well you I think you were pointed to some aspects of that for yourself it it, start, it seems like it's reciprocally opening and maybe initially it is. But then you do this sort of thing where it reifies, and then without really realizing it, you get into an idolatrous reciprocal narrowing uh, that needs to be yes. regarded against in a profound way. Now, Corbyn was, of course, very critical of fundamentalism and liberalism, literalism, but the, and, and that's, I mean, and I don't want to give him a job he never wanted, uh, but we need, we, we need to engage in practices that help us guard against um, the shift into that self-deceptive reciprocal narrowing. So that's really important too. Okay, that's, why, I that's why it's that. really important to integrate the Corban stuff with rationality, because rationality is about being vigilant for self-deception. Yes, I, I completely agree. Um, and yeah, I really love your expanded notion of, of uh, rationality and ratio um, uh, compared yeah. to the, like the other... Uh, malnourishment of the term in the West that like yeah. Andrew Sweeney, for example, keeps falling back into just because the culture is just yeah. stereotyped it so poorly. Um, so I was thinking also, do you think there could be uh, a parallel to, to the phenomenon of the divine double uh, being, you know, how it's temporally after, but normatively prior to one's current self? Uh, but in the realm of one's environment or the world, in that uh, another idealized world normatively prevenes one's current world despite being in the future. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's right. I think that's right. And there's a deep, uh, there's a deeper dialogue that needs to take place because Corbin also talks about that too. Um, there's a okay. deeper dialogue between, uh, you know, the the, the 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 divine double, the sacred second self, uh, and 
um, you know, the, the transfiguration of the world. Um, the, the, the reason why I've been hesitant to talk about that in great depth, although he does, in his third book, Cheatham brings that out, All the World is an Icon, All the World is an Icon, right? Um, and, and it's even in the, in the world turned inside out that the world actually flips in an important way, not just right, the, 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 the divine double of the world is also disclosed, as you're saying. And I think this is all really crucial. I've been very hesitant about this because, well, you, I, I think you're familiar with the fact that I'm very, very hesitant, uh, very hesitant about utopias. Um, yes. And, uh, and, and I, I don't, I, I, I'm not accusing Thomas uh, of, uh, uh, of a utopian fact. He's not. All the world is an icon. The world turned inside out is not utopic. But yet, it, to, to, talk, get, to get this talked about without it falling into utopia is really, really difficult. That's why the object-oriented ontology of, of Harmon and Morton and others, I think, is, is really important. Because it's, it's trying to get us to remind, and, and I'm trying to enact that in the, 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 in the Dialogos, right? That it's incompletable, right? That you can't, yes. um, right? And it's inexhaustible. Um, and so... I'm trying to tackle that problem. I'm sorry, this is long, because it, but it, it's indirect. I'm trying to tackle that problem by really re, first really trying to reformulate the notion of sacredness so that when we talk about the sacred depths of the world, we're not going to be led into uh, utopic thinking. Instead, we're going, to be, we're, we're going to be led into, hopefully, something like what you're talking about, which is the sort of the mutuality uh, between the divine double of yourself and the, the transfiguration of the world. I've been yeah, doing I, a little bit of work on that right now in terms of a notion, which I'm starting to call the trans world, and it's based on an idea uh, sort of, of drawing Tolkien and augmented reality together. Uh, uh, the idea. So Tolkien had a, a theory of fantasy. I, I think I was talking to Jordan about this. Uh, and the idea is you go, the, the point is not to escape into the fantasy world. The point is to go there and go through a process of enculturation, like with an anthrop like when an anthropologist goes to another country. And then the point is, once you go through that process of enculturation, you return to this world and you recover it, right? The point is the recovery of this world, not the attachment to the fictional world. And, I, I, and so I've been trying to get at this idea uh, of that, there's a sense in which we can think of various symbolic entities as affording that kind of recovery of this world. And we can think of it that way, rather than thinking of it as, as a future state that we're going to make on earth. Did, 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 you, feel, did you feel the distinction I'm trying to get at? So the, oh, yeah. The, it, it it's it's kind of like, and sorry, I'm not I'm not casting myself in the role of Jesus of Nazareth, <laughs> but it's kind of like when they ask him, you know, when is the kingdom of God going to be here? And he says, no, no, the kingdom of God is within you. It the, by the way, the the word there is within you and between you. It doesn't we, we uh, think of, uh, we think of it as just so a, a really good translation of that is the kingdom of God is among you, or in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the Gospel of Thomas is the kingdom of God is spread up across the world but men see it not yes yeah right. i like that quote right and so if you can think about the kingdom of god not as a utopic future but as a symbolic thing that allows us to recover the this world i think that would be a way of getting that transfiguration of the world that's non-utopic so is part of the the method it allows us to recover our world by I would imagine by sort of giving a like a micro uh, slice of the entire sort of structures of our world on a smaller scale so you can understand them all and then be able to come back and like stepping back and looking at our world also because you have something to compare it to. Yes. Would that I mean, so be part practices of it? like the view from above or practices like reading profound philosophy from other times and other cultures allow mm -hmm. that deep kind of recovery. Or, you know, uh, Heidegger's philosophy, when it doesn't go off the rails, um, is also constantly trying to, this, this probative attempt to recover, to recover, to recover. Um, so, and, and this ties back to what I was saying earlier. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to refurbish, uh, which was what Tolkien was doing with the notion of fantasy, but I'm trying to refurbish the notion of fiction uh, that 
because fiction is ultimately related to like to to making right um and the idea here is uh it so you know self yourself is ultimately fictional which doesn't mean it's non-existent it means right, like a constellation yeah exactly but it has the function unlike a constellation of allowing you to do this real recovery of right the depths of your psyche in the and the world so there's probably you know if we could see the the the, uh, the the world iconically so we use fictions that recover it and then we relate to our the self as uh, our deepest fiction um in, 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 right then i think uh we can avoid the utopic danger yeah i think like fiction seems to be a very very healthy sort of training for uh it is for well, totally pointed that out in a way yeah yeah i think it's um, important to engage in good fiction like, yeah, I, I do too. Um, and and yeah, Tolkien was also a huge influence on me, so that's awesome to hear. Well, uh, and Tolkien and, I, and Pokemon, so you know about augmented reality too. So yeah. I'm thinking, I think it, I'm thinking of our sacred symbols as fictional ways in which we augment reality, uh, so that we can recover um, in this deep way. Plato's notion of remembering, anamnesis. We can remember, or Heidegger's notion of remembering being. Right or remembering the being mode, so that we remember, so that we deeply, deeply remember and recover. What What's the difference between uh, anamnesis and aletheia? So anamnesis is more um, a like a recovery or recommending. Uh, sorry, a recollection, not recommending. A recovery or a recollection, uh, like I say, uh, uh, of these of the modal aspects and the ontological depths of yourself and the world. Where Aletheia is more the process of the of the of that mutual disclosure. Okay. So, if you, this is this, this is somewhat simplistic, uh, so take it with a grain of salt. But anamnesis is sort of what what happens, like sort of the the psychological result to you, um, the psych, psych, cognitive and psychological result. Where Aletheia is much more the the the, the reciprocal opening itself, the, the transjective yeah. process. Got it, um, and I, I completely agree with with your uh, hesitation for uh, jumping to to utopias and making sure everyone understands the the fact that they are always uh, unfinished, um, because uh, several of the things we were talking about were reminding me of uh, another point I was going to bring up, which was perhaps the uh, the fact that uh, a future. Uh, in the sense of the environment that's parallel to the yeah. divine dub, where it's normatively prior, could be maybe what Alexander Bard is saying in regards to the utopic vision, where I, I know he sometimes brings up this Zoroastrian term about, I forget the word, where is, the world is ever refreshing rather than any perfect in state. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking, then how a utopia could be seen as a hyper object. I, I remember reading yeah. some on some Medium article. I, 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 yeah, I, our representations are uh, uh, functional fictions that allow us to recover um, a real relationship to the hyper object. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know I, I have a very interesting and good relationship with Alexander, but. Uh, it's it's <laughs> and, and you know and we we, we communicate regularly um nice. I, I i still I, you know i still i have trouble reading through what my what i was taught by one of my friends in grad school it's called reading through the medium because all of his freudian language uh, like uh, I'm, I'm very critical of freud in a lot of ways philosophically and theoretically and as a psychologist and so when all that language comes out right it's like oh and I, it, like, so I, I find it i'm i, I find it very difficult um, also, he uh, Alexander tends to just like hit you like a tsunami, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So, it's uh, I, I I I I acknowledge, and I mean that importantly, that I think there's stuff going on in Alexander's work that you're pointing to. Um, I just haven't grokked it yet, right? I just I just it, I, I, I I I get it sort of propositionally. But I don't, I don't, I don't get that resonantly with him when I'm talking to him about utopia. Yeah, I guess I just feel like the the work that you and, and Jordan are doing about um, uh, the notion of faith. I know you were talking about yeah. recently as being like essential to uh, uh, kind of hit a, a critical mass 
Yeah. Oh, did you have a point? Uh, to no, come no, before. I didn't realize I hadn't thought about that, but that is a connection to Alexander's work that I hadn't properly brought, made it explicit. Thank you for that. That's exactly right. Alexander would like, <laughs> he would like, I think, deeply um, the recent discussions I've been having with Jordan around faith. Yes, I see that. Yes. Thank you. You're correct about that. Yeah, I just, yeah, I feel like that getting people um, like on mass to sort of experientially uh, remember that notion of faith uh, untied to any particular uh, static propositional ideology, I think is very important before, before we uh, sort of as, as a global culture um, attempt to uh, like move toward any kind of utopia, even understanding oh, yeah. that it's a hyper object. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that's that's an area where Alexander and I are in uh, affectionate disagreement. I I, I, I I agree with what you just said. I think that's the order, the correct order of operations. Whereas I think Alexander thinks, at least at times he seems to say this. I want to be very cautious because it's hard to, like I say, it's hard to pin him down exactly. Uh, but. Um, but he seems at times he said to me, no, no, you've got to have sort of the utopic vision going forward, right, mm. before you can actually re get that kind of thing going. So that might be where, uh, you know, we're in disagreement, but maybe it's something, like I said, that would could be resolvable in dialogue. I don't know. And I know he sometimes talks about how, like, the initial exodus is just going to be like a small elite. So maybe, yeah, maybe it's fine that... Yeah that each of you are kind of uh, like you're working on what needs to happen first on mass. And then he's kind of like working on something that's going to come ahead of time with a, with a small subsection that hopefully doesn't, doesn't uh, bleed out to the whole population with the misunderstanding of it first. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's yeah, both he, of what you guys are doing is great. He's trying to bring back, well, his, he, he has said this explicitly, you know, the integration of the prophet and the priest in the Messiah, right? Um, uh, you see, even that language makes me cringe because messianic uh, people have been like deeply, deeply destructive and dangerous, right? Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree that the, the, it's like a dangerous territory to tread in. And and the uh, fact that Heidegger fell prey to it is something we need to pay very careful attention to. So. Yeah, that's that's definitely something I feel like I don't understand properly yet because i've mainly understood heidegger through like your work and nishitani and uh like how he you know remained wow. a, a member of the nazi party i feel like there's something i'm that i'm totally missing so get, I guess. get rakowski's book get rakowski's book uh uh heidegger's platonism because uh, first of all it's a great book on platonism to supplement some of the other stuff i've uh uh recommended to you but also rakowski makes a very good point that it was ultimately Heidegger's misunderstanding of Plato that if he more properly understood Plato, he wouldn't have fallen prey to the Nazi temptation. Mm. So, and Lukowski is making a really good argument. Connor, I've got to go. I've got, I've got another meeting at twelve, and I got to I got to shift gears. Um, I hope this was helpful to you. Yeah, this was amazing. Thank you so much, John, for listening to me ramble on a bit in the beginning. But uh, I'm really glad I kind of got that out because I've been wanting to, to talk with you about that since I first uh, imagined us going to the, the retreat. I don't know if Rafe's going to hold one in the spring now because of the virus, but uh, yeah. if they ever start up again, maybe in the fall, that'd be great to see you there at some point. But thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd very much like to go. Um, I'm still trying to get my ear to stabilize. I mean, while I was talking to you, it was it was going wonky. So I hope I didn't uh, hope it wasn't disruptive to our conversation. Um, so you recorded, did you just record this from the beginning? Um, I remember it about uh, halfway through after I stopped talking, uh, basically, which I, is perfect. So I, <laughs> I was more interested in, sorry, I'm, uh, I was more interested in uh, your your sort of case uh, from the beginning, because that was very uh, interesting for me. Oh, well. I can send you the text if you want. I have it all written down, yeah, yeah, basically no. what I said. Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be good. I'd okay. I, I, I can do it. Um, sure. Uh, and then, like, at, at any point in the future, if you ever have time again, I, I actually only yep. went through, like, half of the stuff I you wrote do, for questions. Uh, and, you yes, have but, my ongoing permission to, you know, send out an email, oh, and I will not feel uh, in any way, like, please, open invitation, open permission, send me an email, you know, is there time in this month or in the next couple of weeks, and I'll say yes or no like I've done. 
And I will say yes sometimes. I won't always say no. I'm happy to meet with you and talk to you. I enjoy it. Thank you. That, that's awesome to hear. Um, I'll do that. Uh, stay well and uh, have a great week until we speak again. Thanks yeah. so much, John. Take care. Bye-bye, Connor. And check out the meditation course. You might find it helpful. Yes, I will do that. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye.